You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. Life is not easy. Life isn't fair. It never was, and it never will be. A good life takes grit, because the best things in life come from hard work, sacrifice, resolve, determination, and perseverance. Because grit means never quitting. It means coming back time and time again until you succeed. So on this show, we talk hunting, we talk outdoors, we talk conservation, we talk family, and life. We talk fitness, and we talk strength, strength of body, strength of mind, and strength of character. Prioritize who you are and who you want to be. Get gritty, because life isn't fair, and a little grit can make all the difference. Red zone. Awesome. Hey, thanks for the detailed script on this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, That's, I mean, if we can just, gritty. Bruce, if we gritty. Can just follow that to the <laughs> seat, it'd be really great. Yeah, we're not going to go in any rabbit holes. We're going to stay on script, and we're going to have a great podcast. <laughs> is that is that Burt Reynolds? No, but that guy. And the first rabbit hole is here, everyone. <laughs> is this? That's actually my favorite picture in our entire corporate history of pictures. That is Jack Slack, who is the who was the son in law of Marcus Leupold, and he was the head of sales. And the dude was insane. He just drove around everywhere, selling Leupold and killing deer. Dude, he looks and, like Burt Reynolds. No, uh, like he, he looks like it, a he looks like a legend. The bandit, right yeah, there. It yeah. Is. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we legit we have two guys that work here. That's their pappy. <laughs> oh, seriously, wow. that's their grandpa right there. And uh, yeah, he just he cruised around, and that's what he did. He he just he was selling loophole out of the back of a station wagon. That is so and cool. Smacking deer. <laughs> what year? Is, <laughs> what year is that photo? Because that's a heavy horned buck. That's yeah. a great buck, isn't it? Where look at that? That's look at here his neck. in like Eastern Oregon. Or? I, I don't know where that picture was taken. He was he was a really good friend, and that's a cigarette, right? In the right absolutely, hand. it's a cig. Yep. It's a that cigarette. is, right and hand. that's what's so legendary is <laughs> this guy is like just shot a buck, <laughs> the mustache. <laughs> also, I just sold some scopes. <laughs> Life's good, yeah, dude. He throw looks the trunk. He also yeah. look at his yeah. shoes; they're like dress shoes. Oh, yeah. he like he is. He just got done with church. He's a pimp. Yeah, we're going to show you guys this. We will make sure we video this so you see the visual of what a legend truly looks like. Like this is this is, you know, now today, this is what's kind of funny is now today. Here's this this gentleman. What was his name again? Jack Slack. Jack Slack in a pair of slacks. What a name. With some penny loafers, rocking a cigarette, got his Leupold scope rifle, a beautiful buck, doesn't give a dang. Nothing matches. <laughs> Meanwhile, all of us are like, "Well, I gotta have my Sitka subalpine. I gotta have my boots, and yeah. I gotta have my gloves." It's and pretty cool. He he What's, probably is more successful than no, I'll he ever snuck, be. And I, he snuck on that. And deer. he snuck in on that buck, <laughs> <laughs> dude. Tell me, times have changed. <laughs> <laughs> what is the car? Is that a Plymouth? What does that say Plymouth? It looks like an R. I don't know. Is that a Riviera? It looks like a Buick a, Riviera. Look, I think. Is it? Is that is that right? It, it feels like, like it could be. That could be a Riviera, or it could no. That's, no, that's a, a P L Y N. It's a Plymouth. Yeah, yeah, it's a Plymouth. Plymouth of some kind. Are those still around? Um, they still exist. I, I think they like could. Pontiac. Like I, I remember that company that used to be around. It's not anymore. <laughs> right, Pontiac. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Plymouth. So so Bruce, uh, for folks that are listening, if you haven't figured it out yet, we are in <laughs> Bruce Pettit's office, <laughs> CEO of Leupold. Uh Bruce. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for uh, visiting us. Yeah, uh, it's been a great day. We've we've uh, knocked out a couple other shows with our illustrious guest to your left, oh, Tim, yes. Tim Lesser. Nothing less than the best, <laughs> Tim, Tim Lesser. Lesser. By the way, is Lesser? It's is, not more like. Well, lesser. no, Lesser is more. Mm. That's the thing. Like, all, less is more. Less is more. Created. You guys are marketing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Never heard that. Yeah, yeah. we're we tell. <laughs> hey, we tell your story, bro. You know. So what yeah. is uh, lesser? Is that English? It is. Uh, well, yeah, that's the English spelling. Uh, no, it's German. Um, is it? My dad's side of the family. Yep. 
Where does the where does the red and white complexion come from? Mom is Irish. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. That's why. That's why we get along, man. Yeah, we're using like we said in the last one. SPF, Those ginger SPF jeans are 1, dominant. <laughs> Otherwise, we're gonna burn up. My Me- son is bright red hair, really? see through skin. Yeah, <laughs> he's awesome. Yeah. Meanwhile, is Bruce awesome. is over here sitting like a Viking. Yeah, we learned right. today that Bruce is a Viking. Yeah, it's uh, it's true. Yeah. So true. Like Ragnar. <laughs> I think somewhere in his family, Gino is Ragnar Lothbrook. It's and that's why he's got I mean, so we're talking about this but guy. I mean Pettit is a French name. That was the theory. Pet- yeah. Until I Petites. did my twenty three and me. <laughs> and it blew that out of the water. Yeah. Like, no, actually you're not. That's six percent. Sorry. Wow. Sorry. You're you're from northern something. That's unreal. <laughs> something. I just didn't have enough Native American. I wanted a little yeah. Oh dude, you know? free pass to all the casinos. I wanted that. Yeah. Yep. Didn't happen. Uh, we're at Leupold headquarters and we're in your office here and uh, yeah. I'm looking around and I have some questions. Okay. I need these two to just check out for a minute while you and I have a conversation. Right. Let's do it. <laughs> I think so, that was mostly directed at you. No, yeah. He was, that's how I was so nice. He's like, well, I need you to, Tim never says anything. He's like, Jordan, I need you to shut up. So me and Bruce can have a conversation. Yeah. This is, this is backfiring. Miserably. So Bruce, <laughs> that mule deer. Yeah. Are these all yours? All these 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 mounts in the office. Yeah, no, actually, the mule deer is mm-hmm. so that was uh, taken on a property in Colorado that I've hunted for a number of years. So the McLennan family owns that property. Oh yeah, and uh, you know Russell. Uh huh. Yeah, he's a good good friend of mine, and I've hunted with him for years there. So that's a um, started dream probably buff. started hunting out there in two thousand or something. But that was uh, that was the buck. That uh, was my dream buck out there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he's just just the way he's laid out. That just he just he looks like the king, you know. And that that black tail right there is on yeah. loan from my beautiful wife. Really, Tracy? Yeah. So she she uh, she harvested that deer down uh, in the Melrose unit, which is down near Roseburg, uh, Oregon. So really made a great shot on that black tail. And then there's a white tail deer that. Uh, that I shot, I guess that was a couple of years ago in uh, Oklahoma. Yeah. So just, you know, kind of the Beautiful deer thing deer. going on. Yeah. The black tail really gets my attention. Isn't that cool? Yeah. I just am a huge fan of black tail. They're like <clears throat> a box of chocolates. You know, you never know what you're going to get. Right. Like yeah. walking through the woods with black tail. Yeah. The antler formations are always so bizarre and different mm-hmm. and, and, uh, the coloring is always super cool. That's a nice. Yeah. They're, they're cool. Yeah. So that was a rifle hunt she went on? Yeah. Late season? Uh yeah, m- yeah, middle middle, se- middle middle of the season probably. Yeah, cuz yeah, he looks pretty, you know, he's not t- terribly ivory tipped or anything, but yeah. He's still dark. Yeah. So yeah. this thing right here, this water buck. Uh-huh. Where did that come from? So that came from Mozambique. And on a hunt that I went over there a few years ago. What a cool animal. Yeah, and it was uh where where we hunted that water buck was literally in these marshy, watery, you know, kind of area where a lot of water buck now, you know, they're not always in that kind of this right. was truly where, where you expect the water buck to yeah. be. And it was like it, it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen because you go out there and there's just that's a that would be a nice sized water buck, but there was tons of them. And it was just the right habitat, right place, right it's on Katana Ten in Mozambique and they do a great job of, of managing, uh, the wildlife out there. And it's totally wild. You know I mean? You got Cape Buffalo everywhere. You've got, you know, lions on the property and it's just a, no fence. Um, I don't see very many water bucks. Like when you see like African mounts and stuff, that's not one that I typically see. Yeah. It's a, it's cool. What's their, what are they like? Oily. Really? Yeah. That's not what I was expecting. Yeah. Even <laughs> oily, co- oily. I was expecting they're like water, <laughs> water and oil, and then Which they have the weirdly, they have a, weirdly doesn't go together. But right. yeah. no, uh, yeah, no. That 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 cape is kind of an oily. You get a real oily feel to it. Did it? Did the hair do what it does there? Or it's, or it's a little it dr- kind yeah. of grow in like that dovetail. No, that's it. Really? Yeah, that's it. That's really cool. Huh? Looks like it's been groomed. It's that like way. Ma- it, it, when it I, wasn't. It reminds you of Ma- Maleficent. Like yeah, kind of like Maleficent from the 
It's very just a very unique animal. Uh, I think Jordan that's a Disney <laughs> show. I'm not sure. Like he watches us all the time now, don't you? you just put that baby. I got in. my two. Ki- I got my kids. I'm watching all the Disney yeah, shows again. All the classics: uh-huh. Maleficent, Snow, yeah. you know, Beauty and the Beast, yeah. Sleeping Beauty. You know it. Yeah. I so, it. so Bruce, how long have you been with Leopold? Uh, four and a half years. All right. Yeah. Four and a half years. And before that, what was your what's your background? So I've been in the sporting goods business my whole career. Um, actually, more on the athletic side. Uh, in the beginning of my career, I did a lot in action sports and, and at one point, uh, Brooks running shoes. So performance sports, some of the kind of youth action sports, um, and was in Denver mm-hmm. at a company called Collective International for 14 years and built that company up. Was the CEO there the entire time and, and we built that up and eventually we sold the company and, and, um, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a process that, you know, you go through and all of a sudden it's like, okay, this, this is done now, you know, and, and what, are, and so <laughs> what do I do now? Yeah. I was in really good shape. I was thinking, okay, I'm going to go. Actually, what I'd plan on doing is I'd plan on going and hunting in Africa and I already had it set up with an outfitter. I'd already been there a couple of times and was going to go back and, and spend a, a month or two, uh, hunting there. And you'd always hunted your whole life. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, off and on as I, as you get into high school and playing sports and stuff, it yeah. makes it a little tougher, but um, definitely started out young. My, my grandfather was, uh, the first one I ever hunted with. And, you know, I've just, it's just, I, when I think about, you know, pa- the, what I'm most passionate about, you know, I played, you know, football, basketball in high school and, and, and was passionate about those, those sports. But for me, hunting has always been the most passionate thing. I love bird hunting. I love, I'll hunt anything yeah. and I just, I enjoy it. I just love that being out there. So I'm not kind of one of those that is only an elk hunter um, or a mule deer hunter, although those are my favorite. Um, I, I enjoy doing it all. And and honestly, I, I I didn't even, I didn't get recruited to come to Leupold and Stevens. I, the true story is I saw an, an ad in uh, in Sporting Its Business. Really? And it was this ad that said Leupold and Stevens was looking for a CEO. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, wait a second. I've got a lot of their scopes. I should, you know, so, so I'm in Denver, you know, and I, I look at this thing, I read it and, and, and I probably had, I don't know, eight or nine, maybe 10 loophole scopes and, and, uh, on various rifles. And, and, uh, so I kind of did a little search and I thought, you know, I can do Oregon. I lived in, I lived in Seattle for a while and, you know, Oregon's a cool place. I love Colorado. So that was a big decision for me to leave there. But, you know, I went through this process and got to, you know, just did it mainly because I was a passionate hunter and, and I loved the brand. I knew the brand was a great brand, you know, right. and, uh, having, you know, been in the branded business and, and, uh, and so went through this long arduous process and finally it came down to like a few guys and they said, Hey, we want you to do this. And I'm like, really? Okay. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a surprising kind of thing to go mm-hmm. through and it's been a great decision. And, uh, I, I really came though, because I love the, the, honestly, the family, when I got a chance to meet the shareholders, you know, we're a fifth generation family owned business and it's just, they don't exist anymore. Plus we're a manufacturer. Right. I mean, you, you start to add these things together, fifth generation, 111 years old, right. And making rifle scopes in Oregon for 71 years. And you are, you start to add all these things together. And I was like, wow, this thing is incredible. And, uh, a little intimidating, right? Yeah. You got 700 employees or almost. And, and, but when I looked at it, I thought this is, this is a chance of a lifetime to go and be a part of a company like this that has the kind of ownership that is really about building generational value, you know, and how do we, how do we make the right decisions long-term? And I wake up every morning and look at numbers. That's how I'm programmed. You know, it's just this, this thing that I do. Right. But truthfully, it's, it's liberating here because, um, I know I don't have to do that. Um, even though I do. I know it's about, hey, you know, make the right decisions because it's more important that we're creating a company that is stable and growing for the next generation of shareholders. And that's cool. Yeah, it's unique the way it's been family owned and um, you don't operate with leverage, right? Al- almost none. So you, yeah, we, we own this building. We own all those machines you saw down there. We own all this land right here. That's rare. Um, like yeah, to, be the, debt, to be running with so, yeah. so almost zero debt. Almost zero debt. Yeah. yeah, that's not that's not in today's world. That's just bizarre. Yeah, and it's um, so we're conservative in in that respect. Um, but 
you know, honestly, Brian, with our, with what we want to do and what the goal is for us as a company, we don't need a lot of debt. Um, we just, we just need to be thoughtful about making great products for our consumers and making sure we're continuing to build this really strong brand and making incredible product like Tim and his team do. And, and if we do that methodically, we'll, 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 we'll do just fine. Yeah. We'll get to where we need to be and we're stay focused, right? We're not going to go acquire something. Yeah. Um, well, I want to get into that a little bit, you know, four or four and a half years of your involvement, you know, I want to get into, you know, how has Leupold changed and, and where is it today since when you first got here? Uh, but before we get into that, I do want to give people listening and myself included <clears throat> a little history lesson on, on Leupold. Uh, I want to, uh, you know, I'm looking at these photos in here, like, yeah. you know, who's that gal in the middle there? Uh, yeah, that, that is Ruth Leupold. So, she was the wife of the the guy that you see on the left up there, which is with the fly rod. That's, mm-hmm. that's Marcus Leupold, and and there that's a great story. So so she actually this is this is really cool. But she got Marcus involved in hunting. Really? Yeah. And so uh, that's the true story because that directly deer, from that deer she's sitting on is yeah. giant. <laughs> yeah, they didn't mess around with small deer no. in those days. <laughs> it's like you know, <laughs> it's like. It's incredible. That's such a great picture. So what year is that? Do you, I don't know, do know the year of that exact picture, so I'm I'm not sure I can find out for you. But but the the cool thing is is she was adamant about being about hunting. It got Marcus involved. And Marcus at this at, at the point when that happened, they were already a really successful company here. His dad, Fred Leupold, along with JC Stevens, had, had kind of began this business, right? And they had built this business up to really, you know, you know, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's water measurement and devices is yep. essentially what they were doing. They were engineers yes. um, and had a really successful company. And, and Marcus goes out and he's he's hunting blacktail and his scope fogs up and he can't shoot. And he's like, well, which wait. is, yeah, yeah, that's Oregon 101. Oregon 101. Oh, yeah. And he's like, uh, I'm sorry, I think I could do this better. That's really, you know, you hear those stories about right. entrepreneurs all the time, right? And this was it. It was like, wait a second. You saw a need. I can do this better. And so he began this this process of saying, "I'm going to make a rifle scope that's not going to it's not going to fog. It's going to you're going to get you know great clarity regardless of the conditions." And that was the be really the the same thing we almost try to do today, right? With this you know de- developing incredible clarity and, and strength and ruggedness in what we do, and that was the start of it. And so 71 years ago, we began that journey with making rifle scopes. And you can see there's like an old ad over here. It's pretty cool that, you know, that they were doing, I guarantee you. I remember seeing that in that, in that day, yeah. that was probably a pretty like forward ad. Right? Yes. You know, dreamlined beauty. beauty. And you have like a pinup yeah. kind of right. in the photo with the rifle. Right. Enhance the it's appearance like, of your fine rifle with a Leupold scope. <laughs> that, that is awesome. <laughs> Jordan, so awesome. you need some should marketing I just, lessons. I, I, start, I do. I take I a page out of that book. Things, right? No, we should bring those back, man. <laughs> Everything's about retro now. I mean, can you imagine running an ad right, that ad right now? You yeah. guys, that would go viral. Yeah. They look like, dude, Leupold is legit. They got pinup girls. <laughs> they are streamlined beauties. Well, the thing is, is. That does just scream like nineteen. Oh, it's just so vintage and so cool. You probably can 50s? see it on there. Forties. I'm yeah. gonna say you're. I your, bet it's fifties. Your 50s, late forties yeah. and early fifties, yeah, right? I'm saying fifties. I'm saying fifties. Tim's gonna do a check uh, for us. I'm not seeing it listed on there, but it. Uh, I, I have that publication. I found that. It's just in. I actually the found that in, in Montana in a. Oh, old, you found this? Yeah, I cut, cut that out of a magazine. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. I don't know why. <laughs> <gasps> that's awesome. So, yeah, it was in an American Rifleman. That's where it was. That is awesome. Actually, it might have been that one. What does that say on there? May? 30. What's it say on the top? What's that there, say under the 35 cents? Down below. 1952. 52. 1952. April of 1952. Yeah, that has a very World War II feel to it yeah. right there. Yeah. You know? Um, but but back on that. So so Marcus goes out. He does that. And that's really the, the beginnings. Um, and, and you see him there with Bob Stevens in that, that top photo. Those guys were, you know, kind of iconic figures for us in terms of getting us into really what we do today, which is this hunting and shooting business that we're in. So Marcus Leupold and Bob Stevens. And so that's where, for the last 70 some odd years, rifle scopes and optics have been the focus, but it started 30 some odd years before that yeah. in the water measurements. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So wow. water levels, like, you know, yeah. water recorders for recorders. irrigation ditches and things tracking the, the level of the water that's out there. Uh, there's a lot of forestry out here, and there were firefinders, 
So there, there's a whole pretty whole, cool yeah. museum type of, yeah. of of things that are out there. Firefinders were essentially a topo map that you could rotate around. You're up on a tower, and if you spotted a fire, you could tell people exactly where it was. Hmm. Uh, that is – what an odd photo. Like, <laughs> like he's – I don't – they're standing there. There's a – there's a stove, yeah. but not inside of a tent, no. a wall tent or anything, just like a wall tent stove just blazing away, yeah. smoke <laughs> behind it. He's got a fishing rod in his hand. And Bob's eating a sandwich. He's eating a sandwich. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Just chill as can be. Like, it's yeah. as candid as possible. No, he's They're saying, the... where did you catch that fish? And he goes, and right down there. there. I'm not going with you because I'm hungry. I'm <laughs> eating a sandwich. And Marcus has got you that hand it. on his hip, and he's just like, over yonder. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to comment next. It's like Theodore Roosevelt. Like, right. pro, like just, I so declare it. Yeah, I was just going to say, just, just a, again, a pair of legends just standing there, just, yeah. I mean, with a sandwich, just chilling so, and building yeah. something so, great. So Marcus's granddaughter is uh, Georgia Marshall is her name, and she's, she's you know, one of our largest shareholders and, and uh, just an incredibly wonderful lady and um, and just so gracious and still just, you know, this, this really kind of – cool matriarch of our family that it was just in the other day so it's a it's a it's a neat family that's so cool and so when was it founded so 1907 is there was the year it was actually officially founded okay yep man that's been a minute yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) it's like so i don't think sometimes so, so theodore roosevelt was president at that time yeah well actually one of the things that you'll see in our core values that we've that we've kept is um, Fred Leupold, mm-hmm. you know, made the statement that basically every one of our customers deserves a square deal. And that was during that time yep. when that was kind of, hey, you know, everyone deserves a square deal. That was a Rooseveltian kind of thing to say, right? And mm-hmm. so we've kept that in our core values throughout the history of the company, which is we're going to deliver a square deal. We're going to make sure that you get, you know, great service, great value, um, great quality. I mean, that was kind of the height of some some conservation ethics being you know just just uh, rolling out for the first time. Oh yeah. Um. Just just this fervor of uh, sportsmanship, like conduct. Mm-hmm. You know, getting outdoors, hunting, and for sport in a in a sense like fair chase rather than market hunting for meat and mm-hmm. just selling it or right. mass killing of buffalo, deer, elk, antelope, whatever it might be. Um, what blows me away is the size of those mule deer though. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. holy cow. So that's right around early and, and 1900s. Those, and yeah. also taking note again of, is it Ruth? Well, that would be later. Ruth. So that's, that's true. That mark, true. Yeah. So that'd be later. But, are, but Ruth is just in a, it looks like a dress and a shirt and she's just chilling, shooting big bucks. Yeah. Yeah. So Ruth got Marcus, Marcus. Yep. into hunting, yep. which now you're seeing, a big influx of women coming into the hunting. Really industry. interesting, isn't it? Yeah, totally backwards. You it know, really, back in back it's, in. It's a cool story. That is that is yeah. fascinating. Yeah, it's interesting to see because there's definitely a hunting heritage of of uh, of individuals who who were who wanted to go out and hunt for the adventure of it, mm-hmm. right? And so part of that includes not just going out and shooting any animal, just right. going out and shooting. A, you know, an older animal and so on. You kind of see that in this, but then there's that generation that was like, especially at that time, they just didn't understand hunting at all. Like it just doesn't make sense. Like mm-hmm. there's so many other things to like farming, agriculture, mm-hmm. business, whatever. Hunting was, uh, um, you know, more or less uh, a way to get groceries, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, and so it's interesting that that at that time she had a love for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just it's it's really really interesting. Yeah. So he starts the company and and then uh, tell me the history. Well, of that. it's really he didn't start the company, but it's a shift, well, right? Yeah. It was the shift of of at that point because that was a that was a, a moment in time where eventually the other business was sold off, okay. and the instruments business was essentially sold off, and we became really what we are today, which is a company that's focused on, on sports optics, right. And what we do. And that's, that's how we, we got where we are. So that was 71 years ago when that first scope was made, um, <laughs> that be- began that, that journey. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and with that comes, you know, 
I mean, you think about innovations over time and we have tons of them and patents and all these things, but like we invented the duplex reticle, you know, that's kind of a cool thing. Yeah. Which is why it's our logo. Yeah. <laughs> that's why you can't use that as your logo. Yeah. <laughs> because it's ours. Because we invented it. <laughs> so go ahead, try us. Why don't you put that on the hat? Let's see what happens. <laughs> That's yeah. cool. I didn't. I didn't even know that. Yeah. I didn't even know that, yeah. that was something that's uh, proprietary and, and was a unique in, uh, innovation from Leopold to you guys themselves. That's yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty pretty cool. So when did you when did uh, Leopold start to 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 branch out from scopes into uh, like binos and stuff like that? Do you know? Yeah, I mean, we could go back and look. I, you know, I think what you'll see is kind of the spot, you know, really sick, probably 50, you know, late 50s, 60s, and 70s is when, you know, you started getting development of other optical kind of things. But it was a very focused on rifle scopes and mounts to our mounting systems um, for a majority of the time. And then, you know, as it made more sense, began to branch out into some other areas. I remember seeing my first, my, my uncle and my grandfather, they always did Leopold gold ring. Yeah. Like everything, every rifle right. had it. Right. Yep. And then, uh, and then I don't know, I was maybe 12 or so. And I put my first pair of binoculars I ever used were Leopold binoculars. Mm-hmm. They were kind of rubber coated the whole body. Mm-hmm. They were legit. Mm-hmm. Even like back then they yep. were, they were a nice bino. Yeah. I think even Cabela's sold them for years after, uh, yeah, like still sold the old school version. Mm-hmm. I was like, it, uh, cause they were that good for that long. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I the observation product and, and Tim and his team has done a great job at, at elevating, you know, that Yeah, let's get from, into that because you're, you've been here four, four and a half years. Yeah. Almost five. Okay. Yeah. And where, you know, how are you positioned before that and, and then what what are some of the things that have changed since you've been here well i mean i don't you know we've had a ton of change i, I think anybody who's been around us at all knows that we've, we've 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 made a lot of changes to to really you know when you have a company that has been doing what we do as long as we have um change doesn't come naturally right and you can um rest on your laurels a little bit and certainly the history of 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 loopholed in the optics business is, is a, is a strong one. And, you know, people like, you know, you know, Marcus and Bob and, and on down the line, there's been, there's been some great people that have, that have, have really carried a heavy load here. And, and, but I think you go through times as, with the company that, that is a challenge where it's, it's, you might get complacent or you might have a certain way of doing things and, and you're, you're stuck on that. And, and I felt like when I came in that, that we, we really had all these incredibly great assets that, that, Frankly, we weren't taking advantage of or using properly, and and I think we had we had rested on our product laurels a little too long, um, and that we needed to make sure that that we began a product process that started with the consumer. And so, I really believe in 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 making sure that you understand consumer insights. I, I want to know everything about our core consumer and focus on our core consumer. If someone wants to buy our binos to go to the, a Denver Broncos game, and I don't blame them. That's America's team. I get it. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, hundred percent. But if you but if you wanna, if, you know, if you wanna, um, it, that's fine. That's not our core consumer. Our core consumer is core hunters and shooters. And, and we got to understand them and make sure we're delivering product to them that, that, that they can absolutely at the top of that pyramid can, can get it done. And while we had some products that can do that, I, I wouldn't sit here and tell you that I felt like our entire product line was there. The one thing, you know, interestingly enough, my very first hire, um, in this was Tim Lesser. So Tim had been with the company while he had left. And we just met and I, I forget what the circumstances we met under, but, but we were just having a beer and I started talking to him. We started talking about product and I'm like, this is a product guy. This is great. And his background being a, you know, when you can get someone who has a background that's been, you know, a, a guide and an outfitter and yeah. combine that with a love and passion of product and then a really smart guy who gets it, understands the, how it all works. Um, it, it's, it's pretty special. So. We got Tim on board to begin that process. And that's what we really did. We said, let's, let's make product insane. Let's, let's, let's invest in it. Let's get after it. And, and that's what we did. And it takes time here because we're not, you know, we're not going and kind of picking a, a rifle scope off the shelf and saying, Oh yeah, put our logo on that. 
we're, you know, the Mark V, which the team just launched this year, which is absolutely killing it out there. That was, what, three and a half, four years in development? I mean, that's taken us a long time. We, I knew, we knew we needed that. Three, year, three <laughs> yeah. years ago, and everyone's like, hey, when's that thing coming out? You know, and we're like, hang tight, hang tight, it's coming. But we've gone through this, this process where VX6 HD is new, VX5 HD is new, VX3i. These are all new products in the last five years, four and a half years, right? And the freedom. And so we've really gone through and methodically looked at it. And, and our, we made rifle scopes job one because that's, that is for us, that's our epicenter. And, and that is what we absolutely had to focus energy on and make sure that we got that where it is. And when you go through our line now, you look at it and go, holy cow, that's an incredible product line in terms of rifle scopes. Yeah. Is there still a couple holes here and there? Maybe, but, but it's pretty damn good, mm-hmm. you know, all the way through. And, and now the last couple of years, you know, of course we're ahead of it. We know it's coming. Now we've really focused on observation. So that, so wait till you see the Sandy M spot of this fall. That comes out. That's going to uh, yeah, be a great. Tim spot. lights up like a Christmas tree. We're on the last podcast <laughs> just talking about it. Like, you guys have no idea what we're bringing on that yeah. hunt. We have no, I'm like, I'd love to have an idea. Can you send me one? <laughs> yeah. He's like, no, you got to wait. But uh, you guys are stepping up your game big time in that yeah. arena. Yeah. Yeah, we are. We are. But it's just, it's, you know, you can't do it all at once. No, it takes time. So you got you to gotta have a strategy and you got to stay with it because it's really, there's a lot of things we can put an L on and sell. Um, to be honest, but, right. but you got to say, okay, let's stay focused and make sure that we're, we're really doing this in a strategic way. And, and we have a, you know, Tim has a product line plan out to 2026. So we're, uh, you know, <laughs> do we, we know every we, little product that there? No, but Jordan. Yeah. 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 Don't tell me it because I'll ask for all the, <laughs> the products now. I want that one. <laughs> yep. Can I get that now? No, Jordan, you can't. But, but, um, but it's just it's just been able to work through that methodically and do it. Right? Question for you then: Like, what has been the the most frustrating part of this process for you, and what has been the most rewarding? Uh, the the most frustrating is I'm I know it probably comes across, but I'm a little impatient. So, <laughs> I mean, I want things to happen faster than they can often, and that's the thing you have to be. And, and I guess maybe through my career, I've learned to to maybe. Tim might disagree, pull off, you know, let the reins off a little bit, not, not, you know, and kind of hold and let, let it get done. Um, because it's, it's, it just takes time. And particularly when you're manufacturing it yeah, and you know, it's, it's a different thing. There isn't this instant gratification of being able to slap a logo on something you've got to really, and, and we have an expectation for quality that I don't think anyone else has. I, I, my competitors might disagree, but, but our expectation for what our product can hold up to. Um, because I'm going to tell you what I, what I can't have is when you're up in the Yukon hunting that moose, there's no FedEx. They're not getting you anything that has to work. Yeah. And I take that personally, like it has to work when it's up there. And so for us, you know, our, our, you, 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 you get to get there just takes time and I can get impatient with that. So that's probably the most frustrating thing is you want things to change faster, right? What do you think, Tim? <laughs> I would agree with that 100%. Yeah. You know, we talked about it a little bit with trying to make sure that it always performs. That you got to continually break them until you can fix all the spots that'll break. And it takes yeah. time to, to work that out. You could definitely do it faster and, and go by uh, some gut instincts, but we start there anyway. It's just, it's the unexpected. You, you got to be prepared for the unexpected. And the only way to do that is to really prepare, you know, and, and take time go out it, and break them. You know, one, you mentioned earlier being conservative and, and, uh, being, you know, very low, low, low debt load. You're, you're talking about a company that really values the long game, mm-hmm. right? Um, right. And, and privately owned and on all that, like there's a, you have that luxury too, where you're like, no, we're going to do it the right way over the long game, long period of time. It's got to be somewhat frustrating sometimes when a competitor or someone else comes out with something that they capitalize on really quick, have a lot of great sales, cuts into your market and what you're trying to accomplish. But long term, have you found that you're winning with this model? Yeah, that that's the most. When you ask me the kind of what I what I've what I've enjoyed the most or whatever is, I just think that that what it really is is our strategy is working, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. And and to see it come together, where you know, I've seen in in just the four and a half years that I've been here, the change in in our competitive landscape pretty dramatically. And I can almost, you know, I won't do it, but I can tell you who I see kind of going where, mm-hmm. you know, based on 
the moves they're making. And, and when I look at it, the, 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 the most gratifying thing for me is the, the reception that our consumer now has to our brand. Because we are really articulating the brand the way it really is. This be relentless and where we're going with that, that's our brand. That's, that's what this company has been about. Yeah. This is, I mean, there's, there's a lot of relentless. I'm going to tell you something right now, man. At. There's no guy cooler than that dude right <laughs> that there. Jack's laugh. At that day, <laughs> that moment right there, that was the guy. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, uh, for, to be able to articulate our brand in the right way and, and, and have, you know, a, a family of, of folks around us. And we've had a lot of people fall off where it just wasn't the right fit for them or it wasn't, you know, this right situation anymore. And now I think when you look at, when you look at the, 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 whether it's, it's folks that we're partners with like yourself or a Randy Newberg, or you go on down the line, the, the companies that we associate with, the individuals that we associate with, they all have substance. It's, it's not this hype thing. And that's really important to me because now I can see that this, this can build over the long run. It's, it's happening. And, yeah. And, you know, that's there's rewarding. times along the way where you doubt yourself, right? Oh, yeah. You doubt what you're doing. You've made these decisions. You're like, oh, come on. This has got to go. And it just. Your guys' model is a lot like uh, a Steve Jobs and Apple. You know, they were, their, their why was in everything we do, we change the status quo, right? And so you look at Apple today and their product line and how they approach the market from uh, the tech side. It's so par- parallel to you guys as you're sitting here expressing that. I'm just listening to you say like, yeah, I mean, I'm watching everybody else. I mean, look at, at look at the, the computer and iPad or the pad space. Every other tech company in the world, Samsung, all these guys are always just changing everything all the time, adding new features, all this. And all the consumers are just buying it, right? And what does Apple do? They stay true to who they are, they stay to their core, and they stay the course, and they do eventually release those things that you know, uh, Samsung released four years ago, and everybody's like, get with it, Apple, but guess what? When they do it, right. they did it a hundred times better than Samsung did. Their product's better. It lasts longer. Your investment into that returns 10 times fold, and so it's just like I'm sitting here as you're, as you're expressing that, and I'm thinking of the book, yeah. Start With Why by Simon Sinek, and he parallels that theory of how, how Apple was successful, which I think is just so parallel to why Leupold is so successful. Because you're not willing to sacrifice um, your strategy and your delivery to market and who you are simply to just make a quick buck or, or ride a trend. Right. You're like, no. And, and we talked about it on the last podcast. Yeah. It's, just, it's very cool with the way you guys operate and how you guys, how you guys have stuck to who you are. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. That's that's flattering. I I mean, if if we could be a modicum like them, I would be happy. Yeah, but you know, but it's um, yeah, it 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 takes it's tough to do. And and honestly, I've made so many mistakes in my career where I haven't been patient, or you you see something as a shiny object you want to chase, and every time I've regretted it. And so it's 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 not a simple it's not a hard thing. You surround you you surround yourself with really talented people. You give them the tools and you give them a focused strategy to get there. And then it's hard work. Yeah. You know. How do you find talented people though? That that can be tricky sometimes. Well, you go to a bar and have a beer and get <laughs> yeah, Tim I to bars. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, just <laughs> bars, bars. bars. <laughs> Karma. Karma. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh we you, uh, you know, we have a, we, our industry is great. Mm-hmm. Our industry is great. And, and that's the thing is that what I've found is you've got to have people, and it's not in every single job. Of our, you know, 671 employees here, I, I don't expect that every one of them is a hunter and shooter. Um, I, I think that's unrealistic. Um, I, I expect them to be passionate about what we do. Yeah. You know, and this kind of these epic moments we're able to create with the products that we make. And, and so that's important to me. But, um, the 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 talent thing is about finding people who are passionate about this thing we do. So you can get someone in product that you know you could have an engineer who's a really smart product guy, but if he doesn't get it, if he hasn't been out behind an optic, if he hasn't been out in the field, if it you know that's why we have the Leupold Optics, Optics Academy out in 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 Madras out there where we can get people behind. We can he can take his engineering team out there and get them behind it. You got to get them passionate people. And so you find the talent. So you guys met Kyle, right? Who we yep. just hired. He's brand new. There's an example, right? This is a guy who was a controller for another company, larger than this one. And, and, uh, but I knew he was a passionate, he, he, he actually, I was getting off an airplane coming back from a trip and he, I guess he was on the same plane and he said, Hey Bruce, I just want to introduce myself. And you know, he, I guess he'd seen the uh, hunt I did with Randy Newberg and I just want to tell you how cool that was. And you know, I was an auditor on your, he was he used to work for PwC and he was an auditor here at one time, but 
And I went, this is three years ago. Yeah. Two and a half years ago. And I went, you know what? If there's ever an opportunity with that guy, I'm going to, going to find him. Yeah. You know, kept it. And two and a half years later, he, he'll tell you the story. I, I, I talked, we got a, you know, <laughs> David Dugan, our, our CFO said, you know, we were looking for a controller and I said, you should call this guy. You don't have to hire him. That's up to you, but you should call him. And he did. And he has a, you know, so, so I found yeah. that one little, I don't need 20 controllers. I need one. Yeah. But I, but you know what? That guy loves to hunt. He loves to be out in the field. He gets it. Right. 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 And you find people who are passionate about other things. So, you know, our VP of human resources, she's incredibly passionate about people, Mm -hmm. you know, not a big hunter and shooter. She'll go out with us and do it. But the reality is she's so passionate about serving the, the, the 671 people here that that's what, so I look for that. And then, you know, if you have that piece of it and the core values align, the rest of it, you can get there. You know, it's great yeah. if they come in with an amazing skill set like like Kyle did. But but Kyle's pretty young for that job. He's got right, to be honest. Man. You know, he's a young dude. Yeah. Um, I don't know his age, but he's he's young. He's obvious, right? He'll get there. Which I like. Like if you go to Mountain Ops, everybody's a baby except me. So, <laughs> yeah, know. there's we don't discriminate, but we definitely are. We have a very young group of uh, it's, people. It's it's, it's almost comical, right? Like. It's run by a bunch of kids. Uh, <laughs> drinking Kool-Aid. Right. Drinking a bunch of Kool-Aid. <laughs> but um, one making thing. Making grape. Oh, making grape Kool-Aid. Yeah. <laughs> one thing High-performing I'm, Kool-Aid. Well, one thing I've noticed there is uh, that, again, sim- some similarities to what you're mentioning. A- everyone's got a passion yeah. for what we do, like hunting outdoors, conservation, wildlife, you know, the whole deal. and And then – um, everyone's motivated on their own. I, I liked what you said yeah. earlier when you said, uh, you know, surround yourself with talented people and give them a direction. It's like, it's not that hard, you know, finding talented people though. I think I've watched as, as mountain ops has filled their, their positions and they're out there looking for talented people. And there's all sorts of people that come to the table and are like oh, that one job and want to work. And, uh, and weeding through that and then selecting that that right person is, I think, the difference between, you know, extreme success yeah. and, and, and even extreme failure, right? But – or just mediocre growth, mm-hmm. right? It's this – that finding the right person really is important. And yeah. a good CEO is good at that. Like you look at any – You hosed. look at – What's that? <laughs> no, <laughs> not just told. Yeah, me and Casey were screwed. Yeah, we're – no. We, I think Bruce is a great example of someone who, um, as I've got to know Bruce, he can see potential in people. And so a guy like Kyle, you meet him, a guy like him, like you meet these people and it takes a special person to recognize somebody's potential because what he just said is so crucial in life. Everybody asks me, I want to get in the outdoor industry. I want to, yeah, yeah. how do I do this or how do I work for a great company? And, and the truth is, is like when you come knocking at the door, you've got to have passion You've got to have that purpose and you've got to, you know, it's going to take a person like Bruce to be able to see that potential and be able to say, I can, I can excavate more of that with you here because what he said, what comes next is easier. If they don't have this, it's harder to get them on board and hard. Like he gets his team on board. He has a passionate team of people that are building products and beating the crap out of them, Mm -hmm. making them better. And here's a guy who is running a company with his teams and driving 700 people deep into, you mm-hmm. know, all kinds of different roles and responsibilities. But it's all because every person I've met here, Bruce, and we talked about in the last part, passionate, loves this place. The word family is always in their, cool. in their vocabulary. Cool. Yeah, and it's, it's cultural. True. I mean, you true. hire for culture and who wouldn't want to be part of this culture? I just yeah. don't know. Uh, Tim, I had a question for you, yep. you know, because you're sort of a nerd. Uh, I wouldn't say sort of <laughs> full nerd. Pretty much, For, full yeah, on. He'll, he'll own it. Yeah, Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> so when you're, you know, you're building these different products, you're part of these 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 products and these teams, and you see what what Leopold is uh, developing and and putting putting to market. If you had one Leopold product that you could that you that you could use from now on, nothing else. You had to pick one. It's a bold question. One product. What product would you like to have? <laughs> Trying to catch me completely flat-footed on this, huh? <laughs> One product. Um, you know, it's a, 
Is this? Are you talking existing or made up in in future? I better I better stay away it's, from that. Yeah, yeah, I think you stick with existing, <laughs> dude. It's gonna. It's he's well. out. He's thinking twenty twenty six. Yeah. I was like, um, Sharks with lasers. <laughs> uh, That's the one with flubber. Yeah. <laughs> now it's it's going to be a rifle scope. Uh, I'm a, I'm a rifle guy. I like loud noises and and recoil. There's something wrong with me there. Um, and I, I mean, it exists. It'd be the the VX5 HD. It's a it's a three to fifteen by forty four. It fits on any rifle. Yeah. Um, it'll do anything I need it to. I can practice long range at to twelve hundred with it. Matter of fact, I do um, pretty regularly. Um, but I can hunt with it. it. Goes all the way down to three. It's small. It doesn't mess up the balance of my rifle. Um, and as much as I need the observation stuff to find it, finding one doesn't do me any good if I can't hit it later. So I'd get some boots and I'd start walking around. Mm-hmm. Ideally, I'd have the rifle scope and some good observation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, I just want to throw that little but, monkey wrench in there. He just wanted but to if get you're you. Doing, if he you're wanted doing to get that, right to the core of it. I'll go back to the, to the way I hunted before I knew how, which was be relentless. Just keep going. Yeah, yeah. I spent more time looking at the tops of my boots hoping to die um, <laughs> than I did finding critters, and eventually you get smarter than that. Right? Yeah. But if I did find one, I needed a, a, a sighting device to do that, and I think the, the rifle scope is the number one game changer on that. What about you? Uh, if you had one product, Bruce, like just one at Leupold you had to choose from that you could use, the rest out of the, out of the, out of the question. You gotta it's an interesting one. question. I mean, this is not – this is – you're not going to like it, but it's the exact same product. Mm. That, that VX5, in fact, you'll see a couple of them over there. But that's what I put on all my <laughs> rifles. And I just, I, I mean, I just absolutely love that scope. So it's a VX, VX5 HD, 3 to 15, 44 millimeter. It's, it's, it's li- incredibly lightweight and it can, it'll do anything. I rarely am over 15 power on, you know, and I'm, I'm yeah. a hunter. I love to shoot, but for me, I mean, I love to hunt. That's what I really, really enjoy. Just being out there and, and to me that you know you know doing this is the the ultimate thing that's the that's got to be ethical it's got to be right and that's why we made the decision um you know and you know four four and a half years ago really four years ago that if if you're going to mount any kind of optic on any firearm mm-hmm. whether it's a handgun or whether it's a bolt action rifle or or a, or an AR it has to be made in this factory because I knew it was a clear differentiator for us that no one else would be able to even get close to 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 replicating, and so that's why if you look at it, every single optic that you mount on any firearm comes out of this factory. And I know it can be limiting, right? I know that I could import some red dot sights or something like that and right. sell a mountain of them, probably. But they're not going to hold up to what you guys go down and see when you see the Punisher and you see what we do to these products. And so f- for me, that's the ultimate thing. And so it would be a rifle scope. And, and that's the one I, I happen to. Nice. Well, I love VX6s too, so I have an affinity for a few of our products. But, <laughs> but that's, a, that's a great one. You just broke the rule. The yeah. question was. I know, I know. <laughs> the and, question... then those, and then those new Sanium vinyls are pretty damn good. Dude. Too. <laughs> oh, they are they legit. Are, like, that, so Brian, the the question comes back to you now. Yeah, what's your one? Yeah, dude. what's your one Leupold product? You got one product that you get to go out with. What's I gotta it gonna say, be? I gotta say, um, being the bow hunter that I, I am, where, I know where you're that I, You yeah. know, I love to bow hunt. Um, right now, uh, it's the 15 power Sanium binos. Yeah, like, they're, cool. they're just unreal. But that said, like, I don't want any, I want, I want no other rangefinder either. Like right. I've played You're around. an observation man. Yeah. I mean, but I, I do need a rangefinder desperately too for bow hunting. Like can't live without that, but. That's where, that's where I thought you were. Yeah. Going. I mean, I, it's. I, I, yeah. You and I are on the same They're page. both like. You totally threw us for a loop there, man. I, I mean. just, those 15 power binos are, it's hard for me to bring. Okay. So <laughs> when you're bow hunting. It's not. It's not like rifle hunting in the sense that, um, um, spotting the animals is just like step one. We're we're with the rifle. It's like okay, I found this two hundred inch buck. I'm gonna go try to kill it, right? And you pretty pretty likely you could. With a bow, you're just getting started when you see it. So when I'm when I'm hunting with a bow, I can see through the binos whether that bow is, that deer is a shooter or not. Like I don't need to to be any dialed in more than that. That's a big deer. I'm going. Right. I can tell from his body. I can tell from his his general formation. Is he a 150 buck or is he a 200 inch? But I don't care. It's a bow and arrow. Right. Like that's right. if I get in range, 
great. If I hunt the sh- shot more than the animal, it's I'm not I'm not that good of a hunter like compared to guys a lot of other dudes. So it's like when I go in, uh, you know, I'm not picky. I'm taking opportunities, mm-hmm. and those binos help me find animals that I don't normally that I'd have a hard time finding with a ten power or with a different. Or with the, even with a spotter, you know, you're looking through one mm-hmm. thing, and uh, and so I can tell big is big with with fifteens, and I backpack a lot in backcountry. So for me, I like glassing for hours and hours and hours. And like I said, I can tell if it's big. Yeah, you can do it with those. Yeah, yeah. it's so, much easier than sit behind a spotter. Yeah, so I tend to because you I've seen some pictures of you on your BC hunt where you just mounted those straight up to the tripod and just. Mm-hmm. Start I always gritting video. it. Out. I see a lot of guys doing that now. Yep. He I, was, he's been, I mean, that's, I was trying to figure out what you had on your hunt because I was looking back at all your pictures. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how you were rocking it is you just had those 15s mounted up and you were just sitting there just gridding the whole thing yeah, up. I think 15s on a tripod are way underrated. Yeah. You know, 15s on a tripod for bow hunting when you're, when you're looking for just a mature animal. I mean, it's tough to beat. Mm-hmm. And again, I'm not the guy that's splitting hairs, like that's passing up on a 160 buck because he's trying to get a 180. Like I don't mm-hmm. care. Yeah, I. That's so a I don't need, buck. I'm going to go after it. I don't need uh, a spotter for a lot of that. Yeah, just so you right. know, we're rifle hunters and we're the same way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know it doesn't seem like rifle hunters are, but that's exactly how we are. Yeah, I, well, you know, I that's a good one. Yeah, let's yeah. go. <laughs> we're going after that guy. Well, I did draw a tag in Colorado. Full it, was, send. it was fourth season. I think I had nine points or ten points, something like that, and and it was a fourth season Colorado deer deer tag mm-hmm. late season turned out it wasn't the best year but that was the first time in my life where i really wanted a spotter <laughs> because i didn't yep. want to shoot a 170 buck mm-hmm. i didn't know if i wanted to, i knew that deer was big i just didn't know if he was right there so when yep. when i and i've been on a couple of rifle hunts since mm-hmm. then and with a rifle in my hand i'm far more selective those little tiny details matter mm-hmm. to me with a rifle mm-hmm. or and they don't matter with a bow yeah, it's yep. yeah i guess it. totally fair yeah, yeah. But um, I'm excited about the new, the new spotter. I think you're going to like it. Yeah. And it's angled, correct? Angled or we both straight. You're coming or both. Yep. I'm. I prefer angled, but we're going to have both. Um, there's people still still like both. I, you know, I. What was that? a while ago? I I, I looked at a, uh, a a poll, and they were it was kind of somewhere fifty fifty. Yeah. Between the two, uh, but I'm all. I'm all into the angled, but when it's mounted to my window of my truck, you know, mm-hmm. I kind of like straight. You got to sit on a phone yeah. book, look yeah. down through the sunroof back yep. at it. That's the problem, right? The, <laughs> as the windows get higher, you can't get your head up far enough to look down through an yep. angled. <laughs> and angled I don't, spotter. I don't, uh, I don't, there you, you go. You can, you just got to, you just got to, you're going to be looking at the knees. sky. <laughs> yeah. Let's yeah, exactly. pull gotta, that guy down. Got a spoon yep. now. Well, kinda, and and there, are, I mean, I, I don't typically road hunt very much, but. There are a lot of lot of hunts where we're like when we were in BC up there hunting hunting uh, bear and moose, man, it was just stretches of country for as far as you could see. Arizona was similar, and having a a car mounted spotter was nice. Just spot and then drive to the next basin, spot drive to the next basin, and uh, the angled was tough. It it's way. tougher out of vehicles for sure. You got to lay them over on their side, and uh, it, it works, but it takes a little. But nap. otherwise, I prefer an angled every time. Well, you typically find mountain hunters like angled, mm-hmm. and that's it's just, just because you're trying to sit in there. Your neck you try, isn't like you this. Try to look up mm-hmm. with a straight eyepiece. It's it's tough if you're trying to look over flat terrain all the time and out in rolling fields. So when I was uh, guiding antelope hunters, angled was tough because mm-hmm. I'd want to get out there. And um, you know, small differences in mass go a long ways on score with antelope, right? And trying to get out there, you get a lot of mirage and the colors, everything starts rippling. Every buck on a hot day at over, over a mile, mile and a half looks huge. Yeah. Cause of the heat mirage. It makes <laughs> right. it, it doubles everything. <laughs> and uh, getting out there, it was hard to, to stay low. So if you look at a, at some of our gold ring spotters, they have got a folded light path design. And, and if you invert those, which is what our military does, it gets the objective lens up to be the high point so you can stay hidden in flat terrain mm-hmm. and see. So that's one of the advantages with a, with a straight eyepiece is that you're not popping up as far. Uh, in, a, in a military situation, the last thing you want most visible is your head, right? Um, and, and so that's – Yeah. The, there's a lot of, of, of unique needs for a straight eyepiece that, that some mm-hmm. folks may not think about. Um, mm-hmm. um, Interesting. Yeah. Periscopes keep the submarine hidden, right? Yeah. Spotting scopes can be the same way if you if you do it the right way. 
Well, um, we should. We're. I have one last thing to to let Bruce yeah, speak yeah. to. We had we were having lunch today, and we were talking about this very thing. And Bruce got very passionate about all the things that you guys at Leupold are doing. And so where you guys have so much focus on so many different things in, in the business, and you know this as a CEO, you're, you're having to divide your time and strategize on when to message certain things, whether it's product, whether it's uh, you know some conservation things, but it's, it's hard. There's so many things to talk about. Right. One thing I just felt like before we close this up that I really wanted to let you speak to is how in, truly involved Leupold is in the, not only the conservation space, but the public land space and the efforts that you guys are doing that you're not out there necessarily where there are a lot of companies or a lot of people that are very vocal right now. And you guys are a silent giant in that space. I feel like, and I just feel like people should know what Leupold's doing and, and not, not, not like what you have been doing and what you continue to do for, for conservation, public lands and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, I think our approach to it has been, it's, it's, first of all, we've been doing it for, a while. This isn't something that, you know, Bruce has done. Um, we've, we've been involved as a company for literally decades in, in different ways. And I think if you talk to most of the, the, the conservation organizations out there, they'll, they'll tell you that. Um, but you know, our, our, our owners are, you know, our family ownership is passionate about conservation and about, about, you know, public land access and, and from surely a business standpoint, all of us, have to be passionate about, you know, providing opportunities to, to have our incredible passion and sport that we participate in, have the ability to, to get more folks into it and grow and, and do these things. You know, I was, I was, we, I had a, done a public land hunt down in New Mexico with Randy a few years ago and we were successful. And when we got to the, the trailhead that we took off when we were down there, you know, a few years ago, it was just a couple of trucks that were there, you know, cause Randy, you know, we'd figured it out and we'd done our, <laughs> done our homework and we went back in and we, we had a, you know, an amazing hunt. And, and, uh, this time we, I took, we took my wife, Tracy down there this year, um, same unit. And, uh, it was interesting, right? And it, it made me really happy. And I, I told Randy this, that, that there was a lot of cars in that trailhead. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, they figured out, right? It was, right. it was great, but there was a lot of cars in the trailhead. And uh, trucks and people, are, you know, and, and we're like thinking, well, like last time we were the first ones on the mountain, you know, right. and, uh, we weren't the first ones on the mountain. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tracy's like, what's up? I thought this was like. I thought and, you said uh, this was like yeah, your little honeymoon. But, Nobody knew about but, it. <laughs> but my point with that is, you know, I, it made me really happy because there was a whole bunch of people hunting this public land right there. And I was like, it's so different than even, even I have changed as a hunter. It used to be like, hey. That's my spot. Oh yeah, you know. And now I, I I think it's it's really about look. There's there's gonna be tons of opportunity for a lot of us. Let's this this ability for these folks. And we ended up meeting some guys that came up from Texas and you know people that were there that were local. And it was just it was a cool thing, you know. Kind of this. You know, there's plenty of land for all of us, right? This is a huge area. If you're willing to go, you can. Yeah. You're gonna find elk. You just gotta gotta do it. Yeah. And so. That commitment to like we've had with supporting Randy as an example is he's been a great vocal point for public lands and for, you know, that's his whole kind of thing that he's about. That's, that's one element of it. And of course, backcountry hunters and anglers, we've, we've supported them and, and what they do. Um, at the same time, you know, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, you know, they have a, a, you know, what an incredible success. We have more elk today yeah. than mm -hmm. we've ever had, right? That's phenomenal. What an incredible thing. And so to continue to support an organization like that and, and where they're going is, is critical to us. And so we're going to continue to do that. Um, Boone and Crockett, we've been a longtime supporter of, of, of many initiatives that, they, that they've had, uh, particularly on, you know, for sportsmen, we have to look at how do we, how do we deal with this kind of poaching thing that goes on out there and, and make sure that, that we as hunters aren't giving off this message to non-hunters that we just go out and kill stuff, Right. Mm -hmm. And that, that actually, you know, we're doing things to support, you know, habitat and support kind of more, more, um, uh, you know, free kind of ability to, to, to provide this, this kind of opportunity for other people. And you can't do it if you're allowing this poaching thing to go. No, on. the Nor North American model of conservation crumbles if poaching is just, yeah, uh, falls apart. Yeah. Falls apart. Well, that's, yeah. It was really kind of created around, wasn't poaching then. I guess it was legal, but. Have yeah. Look at what that devastation. And so you go on down the line and, and every one of the, you know, wild sheep, what a great relationship we have there. We support everyone. I, I, I mean, I, I would challenge our competitors to get involved like we are. 
Mm-hmm. I, I'd love to see you guys get involved. At, at, you know, we, we spend a significant amount of time and energy and money, frankly, on, on all of those organizations. And I'm missing some. I'm sure, you know, Mule Deer is going to say where, you know, but we, Mule Deer <laughs> Foundation, you go down the line. We, we do it with all of them. It's important. And um, we've got to do a better job telling that story. And, and making sure that people understand how just how important this is. Yeah, when well, you guys talk about being relentless, you guys are relentless with your product. I just I got that feeling today. And Brian talked about it earlier because here's a man who just that that is a pillar of his yeah. being and is the preservation of of wildlife and wild places and to work with companies and individuals who support that like yourselves. In a yeah, big not, in a big way. I'm out the door. Like if a company doesn't support wildlife, doesn't support conservation, they don't support American values, I'm out the door. Yeah. Like that is not – I feel like it's as a consumer, right. we we make – we shape the world. You know, we shape where this – where we're headed and who we invest in and who we work with determines, you know, has a huge impact on where we are five or ten years from now. Right. And I feel like, you know, with the gritty platform, I don't want to use it to build up a company that doesn't do these things, you know? And I, you know, one of the questions I was going to have for you was around, let's talk Randy Newberg, because I love Randy to death, but he pisses off a lot of people and he alienates a lot of people. I know. Because, (laughs) (laughs) and, and I, I feel, and, and, and yet, you're a brand that stands by that. I had this conversation with Mountain Ops maybe a couple months ago. Where where do you stand on public lands? What are you going to do right. around, you know, where where are you with the Second Amendment? Where are you in these areas? And are you going to put your neck on the line and stand up for those things as a company? Or are you going to play that, you know, that company that's very neutral? I want a company that is willing to fight for what I believe in long term. Like I don't want to live in America where there's no more public land. I don't want to live in America where there's no more wildlife or where there's where there's where all where the Second Amendment is doesn't thrive. Right. Or, or freedom of speech or whatever right. it is. Like I want companies that are willing to stand behind those values. And then here you are like with Randy, it's like sometimes you've got to be going, oh crap. <laughs> Randy's Randy's going off. <laughs> yeah, it's he, here's the thing with Randy. Not only do we stand behind Randy and always will, but I've learned a ton from Randy. And the thing that Randy can sometimes seem that he's, you know, kind of creating this strife or, you know, conflict or whatever. I, 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 you know, but here's the thing if you listen to him, he's not. Yeah. He's actually. One of the most level-headed, straightforward-thinking humans that I know. And what he's saying makes sense. It should make sense to everyone. And I'm sorry if other people can't understand that. <laughs> you know? yeah. But to me, it's, it's like it's straightforward. And so for us, it's, it's just part of its core values. And you, yeah. you, you nailed it, Brian. That the reason that you won't have anything to do with, with a company that's not that is because it's, it's against your core values. This is, this is, this is, you know, this is who you are and you are your brand. And that's the reality. That's a core value issue. And, and, and here with our core values here, you know, they're non-negotiable. Just like you said, that's actually the perfect word. In fact, mm-hmm. every single one of our new employee orientations, I use that same word. And it's cool that you use, cause I use, it. I said, like, these are, here's our core values. They're pretty straightforward, but, but you know, you gotta be a good steward. That's one of our core values. You, you, it's stewardship. And that's what we have to have. And I, I want it for, you know, you know, my grandkids and and their grandkids. We've got to have this and we've got to be passionate about it. So. Bruce, where can people find and read your core values? Is it on your website? Uh, they, yeah, they're listed on our website. Yeah, you can probably find them there. We have a website if you're looking to, to become a... Um, a team member, okay. you can go on there, and I, our core values are, I think, listed on that. Awesome. There, yeah. So you I, can, I remember that was the very like when we met for the first time, and you guys flew us up here, and Casey and I walked away from this experience. That was one of the things that really took away that, that we just really were so impressed with how you presented who you are, why you do what you do, and and your core values and your beliefs. Yeah. And these are these are things that were pre Bruce. 
And these are things that will be past Bruce. These are things that will always be the Leupold core that will never go away. And that's what's defined you guys as a company and continues to define you today with among your tribe. Well, it's, really it's, cool. it's done the same thing with for you guys, right? 100%. So before you came up, you know that I was, you know, kind of had checked you guys out and had read a lot about. So I was really interested to, to when we had our very first meeting with with the things that you guys had going on and you're feeding people and you're doing these things. And I went, you know what? This is a company that if, if, if they are what they seem, we're going to, we're going to have a great partnership. And at that point we were just kind of meeting each other. And then, I mean, very few times do you have, and we have a few other relationships like that, but there's not tons of them where you have a relationship with a company like mountain ops, where you go, man, we are aligned. This is, this is like, we can have a conversation about something. We can get on the same page and we can go Yep. and we can do some great things together. Yep. And so, you know, the success that you and your brother have had is phenomenal. You should be really proud because, um, you guys are smart, strategic and and you make a great product. And so I, I just, and, but for me, it's, you know, we appreciate your friendship and, and your partnership because I just feel like we're, you know, we, we speak the same language. That's all the time. that right there is, <laughs> is we speak the same language. When you have similar beliefs and values, everything else is easy. Well, yeah, and you right. never have to look back or wonder. Or it's right, just right. the integrity is there. The, the, the well being is, is, is there and it's, uh, it's easy. And again, that back to your point, Brian, on, why you love Leopold and why you, you know, have such a strong relationship here is on the same basis of what Bruce just yeah, described. Without a doubt. And I, I feel like we're in a, a, we're at a, I feel like we're at a stage in hunting and in the way that hunting is perceived where, uh, you have an, ex, you, there is a, there is a portion of our public that is extremely anti hunting. Yeah. Right. But there's a huge portion that is warming up to hunting in a way that they haven't in years, mm -hmm. right? Right. And so it's exciting to see that. Mm -hmm. And but more than ever, I feel that with the way that that public lands are being attacked today, yeah. uh, that that public lands are under threat, and, and and hunting though I feel like is under less threat than it, than I've seen in the past. But we have this uh, need, I think, as a community to come together more and, you know, stand united on these things. And so that's why I appreciate some of these organizations and that you're backing them because, um, you know, if, if we are not unified, we just don't have the same strength. And it doesn't mean we have to agree on everything. You no, know, we right. met with Lan Tani and Ty Stubblefield the other day yep. from BHA and we had a long talk and it's like, well, I disagree with you on this, this or this, right. right? Right. But on the whole, we're on the same page. And if we can't get united, at least on this front, which right. is in their case, like public lands, yeah. right? Then, then because I disagree with you, maybe over here on this fringe issue, it's like, we're not going to win. We're not going to, we're not going to keep this heritage. We're not going to keep these, these places uh, intact. And so. Um, I think, you know, we, we just live in that time pe period right now where we do need to come together more and, and focus on those things. That means supporting those companies that actually stand for your values. Yeah. You know? and, and I think, I, I think that's, that is a great point. And I honestly think that for companies, you know, like Leupold and Stevens, like Mountain Ops, and there's, there, you know, the Brownings, where there's others out there that, that have similar kind of, you know, I, I think that, that we need to, you know, you've got all these conservation organizations all kind of doing their thing. And and the ability to find a place to come together with them and for us to kind of get help get them there is important too. Yep. You know, because yeah. we can all agree on a lot. You're right. Yeah. yeah you, you we really can. It. We can agree on a lot of stuff. And there's a lot more power when we're when we're telling the same message in multiple areas. Because to to your point there's a whole group of people that, that are showing interest or are at least agnostic to hunting. And, and when you really kind of tell them the truth about it mm -hmm. and you just, you know, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take no. much. It's just like, yeah, I kind of do want to know where my food comes from. Yep. Yeah. I, I actually kind of do. I kind of do. And yeah, I, and I kind of want to actually cool. get it and cook yeah. it myself. Yeah. yeah. No, that's yeah. great. Yeah. 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 yeah Especially in Portland. It's like uh, I, oh, I was here, especially in Portland. Uh, there's there's a whole ton of people who care about where their food comes. Absolutely. Oh, hundred. And they're like, <laughs> I'm sitting there at the restaurant. They wanna, they're save the animals. And the guy next to me is is like, hey, so uh, I'd like the chicken. Um, <laughs> so I just want to know, um, 
was it a yard bird? Uh, <laughs> um, what did you feed it? What was its name? What, what was its hobbies and interests? No, what did, like, he's stealing this from Portland. I'm stealing this from Portland. Totally, yeah. Totally. Yeah. But that's Portland. But here's I, the thing. It's it's not that far from the truth. No, it's right. not. Like I thought when I first moved here, I thought you know Portlandia. That's 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 can't. There's no way. And then I'm like I'm like whoa. Hey, they nailed it's it. It's close. They nailed They're it. Really close. <laughs> they really did nail it. But I think that the the what I'm also seeing too is just the unification of, you know, some people even say, man, the views you have on public lands where you're trying to even say transferring from state to federal. Like, don't we want a smaller government? Right. That's a conservative view, and we're like. Yeah, we might sound kind of liberal right now. So some of the liberals are like, yeah, like save the land, right? Save the animals. And it's like if they can hear the message, if they can hear it in its truest form in, in a well-described way that they can really understand, then they they don't have to be on our necessarily in our tribe, but they yeah. can be on our team. I, yeah. And I'm seeing that more and more non-hunters that when they, they did a big rally on this in Utah – when Chaffetz situation was going on, there was as, as many non-hunters as there were hunters that were there for the BHA public land movement. Right. Because it was about preserving and the access to this land that these guys aren't hunting on, but guess what? They are having recreation on. And mm -hmm. so I love how Randy Newberg says, I'm, I'm of the party of, of public land and hunting. Mm -hmm. that, that's my party. Yeah, that's right. You know, I don't like breaking it down into liberal, liberal, conservative, or Republican, Democrat, or anything like that. It's yeah. it's the land. It's, it's the, the party of yeah. hunting and fishing. Yep. Yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> the, the, the best example is the guy who started it all. And if you look at Teddy Roosevelt, he wasn't popular um, mm -mm. in in some of those areas. I mean, these were big, bold moves yeah. that were incredibly needed. I, I find very few people. If any, they go back and go, man, what he did for our national park, that was really a bad idea. Oh, right. That Almost. was really, wasn't that a horrible idea? <laughs> the only people who so true. That, you mean, you mean all, there's, wipe out all the elk. Isn't I, that a great idea? Yeah, the only people who I, say I that hate today. my national parks. <laughs> I just hate it. Yellowstone <laughs> sucks and the Grand Canyon. Gosh. <laughs> Going down to Zion is the worst. Yeah, no. Do I have to? Do I have to? This you're is... absolutely right. <laughs> but I, I, I think there's a whole, there's a whole contingent of people that, that still, the people who do that are the ones that really want to take those public lands and dismantle them. You know, um, and uh, but I agree with you. I think that's true. And so to to share that message, I think is critical because when people understand their history, what's at stake and what's out there, a lot of it's just ignorance. Like yeah. there's a lot I didn't know about. You talk about learning a lot from Randy. So have I. Yeah. I've learned a lot from Randy, and I, I feel an extreme um, debt of gratitude to, toward Randy because there these are things I just wouldn't know if I didn't have his show and his podcast to consume. I've learned a lot about, uh, you know, I learned a lot from Stephen Ranella. Mm -hmm. I really, really yep. learned a lot about, like, how to um, present hunting in a way mm -hmm. that that other that the non hunter could could understand it. You know, yeah. because you grow up in this bubble of it's just normal, right. and then you're you're you realize the there's people who wonder why the hell you want to go out and stab an animal until it's dead, you know, within an arrow. Like, what's wrong with you? It's like, well, you know, that, that to me is, is it doesn't need explaining, but it does. Mm -hmm. It does for the person who, who didn't grow up that way and doesn't have that experience. So I'm in great, I'm extreme, extremely grateful to all those individuals that, that share that message. Mm -hmm. And, and now I get to sort of participate in sharing passing on what I've learned and my thoughts on the subject to others. And I think there's that ripple effect effect taking place. And I have some people write in every now and then that are like so discouraged because, you know, American lands council or, or some other anti public lands group is Senator Mike Lee goes out and does some lame speech and they write in there. Like, we're just, it's, we're doomed. Hunting's doomed. You know, public lands are doomed. Wild animals are doomed. I'm like, Look, we're look, not doomed. We're not doomed, dude. There's a lot of hope here. Yeah. Let's focus on uh, and I, I I have this conversation with my wife sometimes and others. I'm like, and if we are, who gives a damn? Because quitting isn't an option. I'm right. not going to oh, it's over and just roll over. It's like yeah. th there's no other option anyway right. for me. So you just got to fight. And you got to be relentless. relentless. <laughs> well, Randy Newberg Hashtag Randy Newberg. Uh, I've seen him like really be, uh, he talk about it recently, like advocacy is uncomfortable. 
And if you're a company like Leupold, like Mountain Ops, it's going to get uncomfortable because when you stand up for those core values, you're going to have people that really push back. And that's something I've come to accept. It's like, yeah. if you stand up for yeah. something, anything important, anything that you value, just be prepared that that's going to cause some controversy. Yeah. I mean, I think Jordan said it right. I think that, you know, you can't put, you can't put people, there's, there's no boxes that you just fit in. It doesn't work. There's not these two boxes and you're in either in this box or that box. That's ridiculous. And we're incredibly conservative. I'm conservative. The reality of, of the matter is, you know what? I believe in, in access and I believe in public lands and I want to make sure that I have a responsibility as all of us do as hunters to, to, to make sure that that stays that way. Because you know what? This is not, I don't want this to end up to some elitist sport that only, you know, millionaires can go out and do. And, and that's where it is in a lot of places. We have this, it's, it's critically important that we have the ability to go hunt on this public land and fish on this public land and enjoy the public land in, in, in a multitude of ways. But, but that's part of, that is, that is uniquely American. Yeah, it me. is. I that is uniquely that. American to me, right? And so that's whatever box that wants to fit in, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm outside it. I'm over here yeah. because that I agree that that is what's most critical and it's, it's critical to, to this company. And to our family and what it's about, because that's, that's who our customers are. And that's, what's important to us. You know, we, we're going to listen to them. hundred percent. Mike (laughs) drop by Bruce (laughs) Yeah, right there, everybody. Uh, Bruce, uh, thank you for coming on the podcast. Um, greatly appreciate, uh, the day down here at at Leopold, Tim, as always, it's a pleasure. I like nerding out. Uh, I don't know <laughs> half of what you're talking about, but it's uh, neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> but he he drops these five dollar words every now and then. You're like, man, that guy is smart. Yeah, no, he knows what he's talking about. No, BXI been... five, two by, three by, whatever. No, it's it, been uh, it's been great. So everybody here at Liverpool is awesome. Yeah, I I just haven't mess, I haven't met a person. Even the guy who wanted to kick me out <laughs> was super nice, Gus. Yeah. Just like, dude, who, who are you here That's with? That's his real name, by the way. Yeah. Gus is Gus. his real name. Yeah. Gus was like, dude, who are you here with? And I, and I dropped Bruce's name. I was like, Bruce Pettit? And he's like, where's Bruce? And, I, <laughs> and I'm like, oh. That's right. and, but I've got my temporary pass. Well, you need an escort. And I was like, dude, Leupold has got it locked down. You are not walking through these doors and getting anywhere past this office without 700 people finding you and being like, who are you and why are you here? But he was so nice about it. And he was just, yeah, he's just, he's just hey, yeah. you're not a familiar face. What are you doing yeah. here? No, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure. It's a great company here. Yep. It's come here. So um, any, any last words? Thanks for all you do. Mm-hmm. Seriously. Okay. Thanks for carrying the message, and we're we're just we're happy to partner with you, and and uh, appreciate you that. know we we really appreciate the relationship with uh, with with what you do, and and um, it's 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 been it's been great so far, and I look to kind of keep it going for a long, long, long time, and as do I, yeah, <laughs> as do I. I look forward to the selfie right. stick in Kodiak. Too, too. <laughs> oh, that's right, Tim. Amazing. Vlogging, stick. baby. Yep. Boom. <laughs> Be relentless. Be relentless. Hashtag. And www.lewapool.com <laughs> and stay gritty, folks. Yep, that's Thanks it. Right. Despite our ever changing, ever indignant world with its growing ignorance of and indifference to the ways of the wild, I remain a predator, pitying those who revel in artificiality and synthetic success while regarding me and my kind as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood. I stalk a real world of dark wood and tall grass stirred by a restless wind blowing across sunlit water and beneath star-strewn sky. And on those occasions when I choose to kill, to claim some small part of nature's bounty for my own, I do so by choice, quickly, with the learned efficiency of a skilled hunter. Further in my heart and mind, I know the truth and make no apologies for my actions or my place in time. Others around me may opt to eat only plants, nuts, and fruits. Still others may employ faceless strangers to procure their meats, their leather, their feathers, and all those niceties and necessities of life. Such is their right, of course, and I wish them well. All I ask in return is no one begrudge me, and all of us who may answer the primordial stirrings within our hunter's souls, my right to do some of these things myself.
What you just heard is a quote from M.R. James. We truly live in a world that is largely ignorant and indifferent to the ways of the wild. And although some regard us as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood, we have the opportunity to change the way these people view the hunter and the hunt. We can share our experiences and nature's bounty with those who employ these faceless strangers. And by so doing, we make a difference, not just for ourselves, but for the wild animals in the wild places we care so deeply about. Never stop sharing your passion for hunting and the outdoors. Our wild animals and our wild places depend on it. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to The Gritty Bowman. Gritty.